Hello and welcome to episode three of Electric Sheep. My name is Paul Andrews and I'm joined once again in the studio by Carl Sykes. Hello again, everyone. And making a triumphant return, it's Elizabeth Jones. Hello. Hello, welcome back. Where were you last week, Elizabeth? I was in Cornwall. I was going to see James Bond with my family. Wow. <laughs> Carl and I saw that at the start of this week. We was quite good. I said, well, I'm quite worried because I think I might actually be turning into the new queue. That's quite <laughs> scary. I've got the glasses and the hair's you getting make there. a very valid point, actually. <laughs> That's yeah. a good cut. So, um, so on today's show, we are going to be joined by Dr. Joe Smedley, who is uh, the University of Wales Newport's head of the Centre for Excellence in Learning and Teaching, our CELT. So she's going to be popping on along later on to talk about, well, essentially the, the people aspect of it. How do we ensure that people use technology to meet their needs? Essentially, to avoid the technology tail wagging, the educational and the people dog, so to speak. But before we get into that, we'll do our usual kind of roundup of what we've been doing this week. So I'll start off with uh, Carl again. Carl, what have you been doing this week? Okay, well, uh, this week I wanted to talk about um, something that I've been doing on our virtual learning environment. At, at the university, we use Moodle, um, but I'm going to talk about the, the virtual learning environment rather than saying Moodle constantly. Um, this week, I've been doing some training uh, with our estates team, specifically the security team who work at the university. Um, they haven't really had any input in Moodle before. They've not really done anything. So um, we had a training session to kind of gauge what their needs were and, and, and how um, the VLE could work for them. Uh, and essentially, what we've decided to do is create a, a, a module that all of our security team can input into um, and essentially create a, a community where they can um, uh, pass information to each other and easily get in touch with each other and disseminate information of importance. So I think that's really useful to, to kind of put across the, the, the fact that um, you know the VLE is a really useful tool but it's not just there for the solely for the educational purpose it's there as a um, setting up a community of, of, of sharing and practice essentially um, and allowing teams who, who may not necessarily always engage in technology um, to, to, to take part in, in the use of, the, of a particular technology and allow them to kind of share information and, 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 and get some, some use out of what we've got here at the university. Excellent. So what kind of thing are they going to be putting on it? Um, well, well, all sorts. I mean, essentially, they're going to use it as a way to communicate with each other across um, across split campuses. I mean, obviously, you know, email's available as well, but it's a great way to get instant impact and messages to each other if they need to get in touch with each other quickly and disseminate important information out. Um, they're going to use it as, as a practice tool because some of them are on, on courses at the university. And it's a great way for them to kind of get an idea of how Moodle works and kind of navigate their way around um, the VLE. Mm -hmm. um, and also to post up resources that are particularly particularly useful and valuable for the security team as a whole to be able to get quick and easy access. Um, so there's loads and loads of ways that they're going to be able to use Moodle. And I think those were the, essentially those were the basics that they were thinking of. But I think once they uh, get gets into the use of the, the, v, the VLE and actually kind of make more use of it, I think they'll find there's loads of things that they can do and, and kind of um, uh, work with that's available in, in Moodle itself. Right. So is, it, is, it, is the security team, is it quite a big team or is it like a small? No, it's a fairly big team. I think, I think we're looking at around about 10 to 15 members right. of staff so it's, okay. it's a fairly big team and um, obviously they're not all around at the same time on, mm -hmm. on, on any given day and they are also split across campuses which makes it difficult for them to always be in instant touch with each other so I think it's a really useful way for them to make use of a technology that's there and available um, and it seems such a shame if it's available to not be making use of this yeah. valuable tool. Yeah so I suppose one person could say leave a message and then someone else might pick that up the following day but they might not ever actually see one another face to face. Absolutely patterns and absolutely and stuff. Oh, right. yeah yeah so so i think that'd be really really useful and uh uh, I, I think that we'll find that, well, I mean, my response from the training session, which which pleased me greatly, was that they found it fun, uh, which it's is a good. word that I've yeah. not heard <laughs> used very often when training people on our virtual learning environment. Interesting, useful, I've heard those words before, but yeah, fun, fun was a new one for me. So, you know, I think I think there's definitely going to be a good uptake on it. Mm. That's really good. I mean, it's it's kind of... It kind of hammers home the point that everything that we're kind of advocates of, it's not just for, we put labels on people go, you know, you're a student, you're an educator, but actually just people can use this as long as, and as long as it benefits them, it's, it's a good thing. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, you don't want to be kind of setting up modules willy nilly for people to just post the odd bit of nonsense in mm. and that, but, but if it's going to be used for real reason that will benefit a team, then I yeah. can't see anything better than that. It's a fantastic tool to have on hand and available um, for those guys to use. That's brilliant. That's fantastic. And, and it segues rather <laughs> nicely into what my colleague Elizabeth is going to talk about we next. So you, you two might have planned this before this, we actually get... <laughs> Not at all. I, I, I haven't seen Elizabeth for... No, no, we have maybe planned this a little bit. Yeah, just a, a tiny bit. bit. 
Yeah, because I was actually doing a, a, something a little bit similar, which is um, setting up for the Faculty of Education and Social Sciences. We've been setting up a research network for them because there's a lot of people engaged in different research projects and th there's lots of research groups and mm -hmm. centres um, within the faculty because it's a very big faculty. It's, you know, very diverse. Um, and they wanted a somewhere central so that they could, everyone in the faculty, all the staff and the PhD students could see all the different things that were going on, um, all the different centres that were there, what their focuses were, what each individual researcher's strengths were and what they were focused on at that moment so that they could offer help, see what events were happening, publicise things that they've had um, published in journals and stuff. And um, it w we were setting this up, but the thing that came out of it that was really interesting was that although the technology we was very easy to put in place we gave them forums and databases and things to to put all that up there was that it really needs the human side of mm. it to put in place somebody to control and and push people into using this because it's not like those resources aren't already out there there are yeah. already web pages for this but it was that they needed that interactive environment for it. All oh, right. So, I mean, for those folks who are who are maybe aren't familiar with kind of how Newport University works, um, we've got two main faculties. Um, so this this resource you've created for one faculty is roughly fifty percent of the entire of the entire institution. Yes. And enable them all to communicate with all the yeah fifty percent of say the academic staff. Right. Um, so. It's yeah. A lot of it that we created was based around forums. So mm -hmm. there's a forum for them to just generally discuss things, and then there was a forum for offering and um, requesting help with research projects or um, you know assistance in data analysis and things like that. And um, but what we ended up having a discussion with the person that I was working with about how a lot of the work was going to have to be done after we'd set this up. It's about um, encouraging people to use this, um, these tools. It's creating the community because it, a lot of people don't realize that when you set up something like a forum or yeah. a chat area or um, something like that, you, you have to do a lot of work to, on the human side of things to get people to use it and you reach a sort of critical mass once people get posting on a forum it becomes a resource in its own right and then people sort of take over that work of, of encouraging each other to use it um it's a theory it's called the, the communities of practice yeah the idea of communities of practice was something put forward by um someone called etienne wenger i believe mm-hmm um, and he put forward this idea and has developed it. And there's a lot of um, research out there for anyone who's interested in reading about it. Mm -hmm. um, and it's been, the ideas behind it have been developed by a lot of people. But something that I always suggest that people have a, a quick look at is uh, Professor Jilly Salmon, mm -hmm. um, who's put forward this five-step model of e-moderation and um, the stages that the leader of the the um, forum or whatever you'd have goes through and also the ones that the users go through and as the leader um, has to take a, a quite an active role at the beginning while the students or whoever they are are taking their initial steps yeah. and then their roles kind of reverse and, and they cross over in the middle as the students take uh, more active roles right. and begin supporting each other and the um, moderator takes a side role and just becomes a sort of guide on the side oh, and okay. so i mean uh, that's quite good then because i suppose it doesn't really matter what technology people are using it's all about people communicating so you could be using i mean you know we, we've, we've name dropped moodle already but actually doesn't really matter if you're using moodle or if you're using blackboard or if you're using yeah whatever it might this be. is applicable to any kind of online or blended learning environment right. um where you've got a lot of people communicating and it takes place in businesses, education mm -hmm. um, and, and in social circles, communities of practice could be, you know, lots of people who are enthusiastic about cars or um, music or anything. Yeah. <laughs> it's applicable to all situations. It's basically about allowing people 
who want to come together to learn how to do something and to share ideas, it gives them a way of doing that without having to physically meet up with one another, which can sometimes be problematic, I guess. Yes, particularly in um, universities where you've got people who, especially at Newport, we've got a lot of um, mature students who yeah. come back to education. They've got work, they've got kids, so they will come in for their lectures and mm. that's all the time they can manage. So coordinating schedules can be a nightmare. Yeah. Gotcha. I mean, uh, we, we've mentioned a couple of things just to say um, we do now have a website. Um, the address is electricsheepshow.tumblr.com. So everything we mention on the podcast, we will put links to um, underneath the podcast as well. So we'll put links up to, uh, you know, Dilly Salmon's work um, and other links up to communities of practice. So if people want to have a go and learn more about this kind of stuff, then they can do Yeah, there's lots of amazing resources out there. And if you are within Newport University, there is a section on the CDEL website with all this information as well. Yep. That's brilliant. Well, um, I'll tell you what I've been up to. Um, there's two things really to tell you about. The first one, I've already alluded to it. I've spent um, a little bit of time this week wrestling uh, with the technical side of this particular podcast uh, in that we now have a, um, a, a Tumblr blog for the show. Um, we've also got an iTunes. We're also on iTunes, so... I spend a little bit of time messing around with a service called Feedburner. I had to try and figure out how to get the podcast to show up on iTunes because it wasn't something I'd, I'd ever done before. Um, so a, a little bit of Googling later on, I, I managed to kind of cobble together a solution which now works. So it, what that basically means is that if you do want to subscribe, you can subscribe on iTunes, but you can also subscribe using any other podcast software that you might have. So if you haven't got an Apple device, it doesn't matter. You can still subscribe. And we're also on Facebook as well, which is facebook.com forward slash electric sheep show. And we're on Twitter as well. Our Twitter handle, I've changed it this afternoon, actually, to make it the same as everything else. It's now E Sheep Show. Be very careful how you say that. E Sheep Show. That's our Twitter <laughs> handle as well. Which but, is um, particularly suitable if you're from Yorkshire. You know, like, e Sheep Show. <laughs> e by gum sheep. Yeah. So, but yeah, so we're all kind of, we're all online now, which is great, which means uh, we are able to take, get feedback from people. Um, and it'd be really nice if people can rate us and comment us on iTunes as well, because we do want people to give us some feedback so we can make this even better. Yeah, absolutely. So that's, that's the first thing. The second thing... Um, is I got invited to speak to all of the first year psychology students uh, here at the University of Wales Newport. They do a module, uh, which is what's called a common core module. The idea is we have students coming in from all sorts of diverse backgrounds, mature students, kind of traditional yeah, 18 year old students, um, all sorts of um, academic experience. And so they have this module which basically gives them the skills that, that they need in order to succeed on their particular degree program of choice. So in this case, it was all of the psychology students. So they will learn how to do things like how do you reference, um, how do you use the library services properly, how do you carry out research, how do you do presentations, and you know things like that. So I got invited in basically to speak to them about how you give effective presentations. I mean, I don't know why they asked me, but there we are, never mind. Um, but essentially, I went in, showed them, a, a, well, I'll put the video um, that I showed them actually on the podcast as well. There's a little, uh, there's a comedian uh, that does this thing about um, things not to do with PowerPoint. So I showed them this little video. It's really, if you are an educator and you are teaching your students about um, presentations, it's, it's a really nice video to show them because it talks about things like um, colour schemes, not uh, putting every line of text you're going to say up on the slide, not overusing bullet points, not going crazy with the animation, which a lot of people can do, and all that kind of stuff. So I showed them that video, and then I showed them some tools. Um, and I basically turned around to them and said, well, you know, what are the challenges that you face uh, when you have to do presentations, particularly group presentations? And well, just like Elizabeth was saying, the, the main, and Carl, actually, the main challenge that they had was a lot of them were, were mature students. You know, they've got part-time jobs, they've got partners, they've got children. They can't find the time to physically all meet together and practice their presentations. Mm -hmm. So what I was showing them, I showed them two tools. The first one, and we've mentioned them on previous podcasts with slightly different uses. The first one was Google Docs, but Google Docs presentations, which um, I said to them, look, you know, you, you can either use this to work on a presentation all at the same time. Uh, the technical term for that is, is uh, using synchronous editing. Um, so one person could be at the university, someone else could be at home, someone else might be on their smartphone, somewhere else, and they're all working on it together in real time. Alternatively, you can do what's called edit 
put the teeth back in, editing it asynchronously, which is a basically a fancy way of saying one person can edit it at five o'clock and then someone can come at seven o'clock and do their bits and bobs. So it gives the students the flexibility and the choice about when they want to do this work together. So I showed them uh, that with uh, Google Docs presentations. Um, and then I also was asked to show them something flashy, something whizzy. So I showed them Prezi, which again we've mentioned in previous um, shows. Um, but the emphasis on that one, again, was very much on, yes, Prezi allows you to have these kind of zooming presentations, uh, but really it was about the collaborative nature of the presentation um, creation. So I, you know, I said to them, look, you know, you can either do this all at the same time, or you, you know, so someone can log on at one o'clock in the afternoon, do their bit, and someone else can come in at five o'clock and, and, you know, and do their bit. The main advantage, I mean, if you're an educator, Google Docs is, is probably slightly better than Prezi in that it tracks everything that each individual group member does. Because one of the challenges that educators face with group work is, how do you mark it equitably? Uh, you know, because you, you, do you give everyone the same mark when sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes it's fairly obvious that maybe one or two have done a little bit more work than other members of that group. Well, Google logs out all of the activity. So it means an educator can come in and see exactly what each individual's done so that if you want to, you can give that group an overall mark. But if you want to, you can also give individual team members credit for the work that they've done. So you don't have to do it, but it's, it's an option, essentially. So, um, so yes, it was just those two tools, really. And um, I finished up by saying to them, look, you know, we do this Wednesday afternoon drop-in session. So if you do want hands-on, uh, if you want face-to-face -face guidance and support, come and see me on the Wednesday afternoons. Um, and which, uh, to be fair, a couple of them actually have started doing, which is quite nice. And they're bringing their own, they're bringing their own kit in, they're bringing their own laptops in, and we sit down with them with a cup of tea and uh, help them get to grips with uh, the software if they're not too confident with, with using it, basically. Well, that's really useful because I think you know I think when it comes to something like pr presentation creation, um, you know if if you set that task, I think nine out of ten students will probably assume that PowerPoint is the only way forwards, and yeah. I think it's nice to kind of break that that myth that there's nothing else out there to create a presentation with. Yeah. At, but you get the extra added value of being able to track who's doing what, and I think that's a really useful um, addition to this kind of presentation set of tools. Mm. So. I mean, there were a couple of sighs of relief when I said it was free. Uh, because they were first years, they were contemplating having to buy Microsoft Office. And, and yes, if you're a student, you can get it at a discounted rate, but it's still not the cheapest software to buy in the world. No, so no. I was able to say, well, look, you know, these, these two tools are completely free of charge and they just work and it doesn't matter if you've got a PC or a Mac or a Linux-based machine, they just they work in the web browser. So that, that went down quite well as well. There was one student who, who just, like the day before, bought Microsoft Office and they weren't very happy, but... Well, what, can, what can you do? What can you do? Absolutely. I'm sure it'll come in handy another day. Okay, so now we are joined in the studio by Dr. Joe Smedley. Joe, welcome along. Thanks very much. Um, thank you for being here. Thank you. For, um, you know, Joe's actually stepped in. Um, not quite at the last minute, but we had other guests lined up and they couldn't come. So Joe said, "Yep, no problem. I will." She's so. Uh, all credit to her. She's kind of stepped forth and has saved our bacon today. But it's really great to have Joe here because. Um, she's something of an expert in using technology to enhance education, but focusing on a more kind of people aspect of it. How, how, do you bring, is, how do you bring people along? Yes, that's right. I think a lot of people talk about technology and they look at the nuts and bolts. They uh, can get quite fascinated with the, uh, the gadgetry of mm. it. Whereas my particular emphasis is how it can enhance people's practice yeah. and how it can really bring learning alive. Yeah. I'm quite passionate about it. Yeah. So, um, no, I always just want to, you know, get hold of people and say, actually, you've got it the wrong way around in the sentence. It mm. should be about learning first and how you can enhance it. Gotcha. So, I mean, for people who are listening who perhaps don't know how Newport University works, um, you are the head of the university's CELT, which is the Centre for Excellence in Learning and Teaching. What, how would you explain, what, what is a CELT? What does it do uh, in layman's terms? Well, it was, the CELT, CELT at Newport was actually born in 2008 and it emerged as a, um, a research-informed teaching uh, centre. It had that emphasis uh, predominantly to, to encourage academic staff to think about how they were bringing their research into their learning and teaching. Um, and it went along in that form under the leadership of Professor Simon Hazlitt mm -hmm. for around about three years. And then last uh, mid-2011, 
they decided to, uh, the university decided to restructure. And actually from a kelp point of view, it was a, they seized a golden opportunity to broaden it out because they could see what had been achieved from a research uh, aspect. Yeah. And they decided to broaden it out to a more academic practice. So there are now over 40 staff in kelp. And it's uh, not just the, well, there's digital enhanced learning, but there's also both libraries, there's careers and employability, there's study advice, uh, and there's academic and professional practice. Yeah. Quite a diverse set of people to work with, but also a diverse offer to staff and students. Mm. So it's quite a, a widened um, opportunity for staff and students. Before it was just primarily staff. Yeah. Whereas this is now linking. Far, in a far broader way across the university. Right, okay, so it cuts across everything that university Absolutely. does. It's Absolutely. Got, yeah. I, one of my favourite descriptions of us is that we're actually at the heart of the university. Right. Um, and when you think we link across Killeen and city campuses, there's two environments there. At city campus, it's quite easy to sit in the library and feel you're at the heart of the university. Mm. Because everybody sees you when you walk past you know, it's, yeah. uh, sometimes if you're sitting upstairs, you can still see the library as, as I saw Carl yesterday when we were at uh, City. You know, it's a very transparent atmosphere. Yeah. To be at the heart of the university here can be quite hard because everybody's in separate buildings sometimes, in separate rooms. Mm -hmm. But I still think across both campuses, Kelt is at the heart yeah. of the learning experience, not just from the staff point of view but also the student, because we have staff as student here. Right, okay. Staff as learners. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we need to be reaching out to people so that they can feel supported. Right. So, I mean, in, in doing that, does technology have a role to play with that kind of, it, the idea of the, the kelp being a, a supportive mechanism across the institution? Absolutely, because with the two campuses, and indeed, you know, reaching out much further afield, we shouldn't just restrict ourselves to, well, we've got to see our people to be actually linked with them. Right, okay, yeah. Um, so first of all, I think just linking with the two campuses offers us a, a unique opportunity to get people to think, well, you don't have to book a meeting with somebody to move things forward. Yeah. You can use technology to link with them. Mm -hmm. And neither should we, we let people think that they have to just work between in office hours. Right, yeah. So technology has this embedded uh, aspect to it. There's a danger then because actually then you become a 24-7 for us. Yes, yeah. So it is a balance between the two and that's where it's important to actually work with people to realise that technology shouldn't take over your life. Mm. It should be a part of your life. Yeah. Um, certainly it's something I'm working, you know, I, I, I suggest to all CALT staff that, you know, you shouldn't be working all the time. You should have a life and work should be part of it. Mm. Same, same parallels with technology, you know, but technology should be in your formal life and your informal life. People don't always see that the TV flicker, they don't associate that with technology. Right. I see. Yes, so, so it's, so it's all, it's, it's all around you. It's mm. how you use it yeah. to enhance um, your operation and make yourself effective and efficient, mm. more effective and efficient. Yeah. And some people don't need to know a lot of technology to do that. Yeah. When, we, when we had Amanda, and one of the things we said to Amanda was, is there anything that you've taken from work and you now use yeah. at home? That was the kind of asset test. But I suppose it, it can work the other way as well. It, it, there, there might be technology people use outside of work. Yeah. But, but they haven't yet necessarily made that conceptual leap. But, oh, I could use this I for... think the biggest challenge when people use technology is confidence. Right, yep. And if somebody says, oh, well, you know, I've really got loads of gadgets at home and I really explore um, and I, I'm quite creative and I'll have a go, then they tend to be the people who will come into work and mm. have a similar, not be afraid of taking something apart and putting it back together again. Yeah. But I'm sure you've got people who are... I'm sure we've got people here as, as staff who are quite competent mm -hmm. using situational technology, for instance, all different types of technology which they don't think is technology. Yeah. But put them in a more in an environment where they're not completely free, mm -hmm. or they don't they think they're perceived as some barriers. Yeah. They'll say, "Oh no, we don't do that." Yeah. But they do. It's just this encouragement and support that's needed. So they still feel they've got some sense of ownership. Gotcha. You mentioned situational technology. I mean, for people who are listening and thinking, what, what, what's situational technology? All sorts of sort of standalone gadgetry. Right. Okay. 
as opposed to online gadgetry. Right, okay, so it could be it could be a phone, could be Absolutely. a... Absolutely. You know, whatever yeah. it might any, be. Any little thing that involves technology, mm -hmm. that, that can lead people to online things. Gotcha. Yeah. And that can be quite a big gap for some people who are quite happy with their mobile phone. Mm. I'm sure we can all think of people who uh, use quite old-fashioned mobile phones. <laughs> yeah. And, I've got uh, one. <laughs> yes, yeah, I don't want to change my phone because I really like my phone. Yeah. Well, why should they have to change their mm, phone? Yeah, quite. You know, why have they got to move up to the mm. latest gadgetry if they're comfortable with it? Because in their world, it works. Mm. But it could lead them on to something else, more an online um, a website or something, mm -hmm. and it could give them that link to explore. Right. So, so it's like saying, well, use what you've got. To its fullest potential uh, before you feel yeah. the need or the pressure to go out and buy well, the latest. Use it as, a, as a, a pathway to get to what you want. Let the information and your need drive you know, what you're learning. Mm -hmm. Because if you've got the passion and the interest for it... Yeah, it's almost like going back to what you were saying at the beginning, making sure that the, the learning is there before the technology. So. And we, sh we shouldn't necessarily feel that... Um, everybody's got to have the latest, wittiest piece of gadget mm. and the all singing or dancing skill base. Yeah. Because people don't need it. They just need, there's so much information around now. You just need the information that you need for a particular purpose. You can't possibly hold everything in your head. Mm. So, what's the, let's say someone's listening to this right now, they might be, let's say, they're a, a secondary school teacher or something and they're thinking, right, that's brilliant. How would somebody like that? who maybe wants to develop that confidence, what would be the best way for them to to get that experience or to to get that confidence in using the technology? They might have a phone or something they want to try and use with their students, with their pupils. I think it's very easy to, to get hold of a how can I use this gadget mm -hmm. book. Yeah. But I, I tend to maybe use the first two, three pages of something like that and then I chuck it away. Yeah. Because I'm really <laughs> bored with it by that. I'm, I'm very much a sort of, I want to find out how this works. Right. And for me, being very much an action research person, it's, it's finding out how things work and when you actually learn what it's all about. And that can often be a challenge because then you maybe get stuck halfway through with, mm -hmm. oh, geez, I've taken this bit off and I can't get it back on again. Yeah, yeah. But I think here at the university, we've got a, a really ideal opportunity. We've got a community of practice that's mm. actually quite unique. You don't have to actually set up a community of people just looking at technologies. You can have a community of people that have, who've got an iPad for Christmas. Yeah. Now can we find out how it works? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And now can we find out what I can do with it? You know? And has anybody explored this little package on it? And likewise with with mobile phones has anybody thought of you know i've got a blackberry well i don't really know how to use it mm. i've got an htc and i wish i knew how to do this on it yeah and that sounds a very lame sort of way into technology but the next thing is hey have you tried to use this website on the phone right so it's almost about finding people or maybe just talking to people in the staff room with a cup of coffee going well I've, you know I've, i'm trying i've got this what do you think about it's, this it's finding the finding the technology levers that are in everybody's day space mm. And building on from there to bring them into the the real world of what technology can offer in in, in a wider sense of learning, mm. because we're because we're such in a twenty four seven world now, people don't have the time to fully explore things. They have to grab opportunities when they've got a gap in their time. Yeah, and that might be if they wake up first thing in the morning and say, "Hey, I'll have a look at this now." Mm. So it's giving, it's opening that access. But sometimes I worry that technology is used as well, it's there, you can access it, you know, I want you to look at it because it's available all the time. Mm. And to me, that's when it's abused. It's It needs to be managed quite carefully because people do need that sane space. Yeah, absolutely. You it's need, it's very easy to find yourself space. swamped by the yeah. technology and before you know it, it's, it's almost impossible to kind of escape the, gra the, the grip. Yeah. So, one absolutely. Of the, one of the things I'm always concerned about with the use of technology is because it enhances the speed that people can work at and, it, and access... Um, and just do things people don't reflect enough mm. they don't think about all the information you know you might have four or five times the speed of information coming at you yeah and you're just happy to have this speed mm. and what do we hear about increased broadband speed and increase or you can download even more but you still need to be able to reflect i mean that's a really important employability skill and it's one of the one of the aspects that employers say we want employees who can actually 
look creatively at a problem mm. and think about how to solve it. Well, to do that, you've got to be able to reflect on, well, actually, what information do I need? Mm. Um, it might not be rushing off for the latest piece of tech technological yeah, we get we get people coming into the department saying, you know, I we're thinking of buying iPads, and you have to say to them, <laughs> yeah. what for? Why yeah. do you want right. them? What do you want to do? Have you thought it through? There's a real tendency to think about technology will solve the problem, yeah. and you know, Babbage's adage of garbage in, garbage out. Yeah, yeah. You know, you've got to be really careful, but it's it's we're, we're in a now world, and people will reach for hey this looks shiny this looks mm. good this will sort my problem mm. yeah. i just need to have a lesson from somebody to show me how it works and, yeah and that's what it's thank you know I just I just stand back and think about what you need what you're trying to do because mm. the kit that you're buying might be half the cost yeah and you might in your mobile phone you might have already got this the techniques yeah that you, look yeah. at what you've already Absolutely. got and what you actually want to achieve yeah. and there was a, so I've just been looking it up, but there was a, a TV show, uh, The Tonight Program on ITV, and it was called Is Technology Taking Over Our Lives? And it was really interesting mm -hmm. because um, they, had, you know, they followed various individuals, uh, but there was a, a business that they went into, and it was a small business, you know, uh, like an SME, um, and they had a, an email ban, and they said, if you want to talk to your colleagues, you've got to go and physically talk to them. There are no phone <laughs> calls, no emails, no nothing. But it kind of transformed the business over the course of a week because what it meant was that obviously kind of people were building kind of personal relationships, mm -hmm. like, like working relationships, but also it was slowing things down a little bit, not to the detriment of the business, but what they were saying was, well, everyone felt this uh, need to do emails in the evenings and then other people were applying in the evenings, so it's putting pressure on and people were getting actually less done because they were worn out because they were on the go 24-7. Mm -hmm. So it enabled them to focus on people tasks. I think it's terribly important in an organisation to still have structure. And I mean structure, I don't mean barriers, I mean structure and guidelines as to how to use technology. Mm. Um, I agree with you totally. If you, I don't, um, unless it's really urgent, I don't email at weekends. Yeah. I never have done email at weekends mm. since I've been um, leading Celt because it's not the fact that I choose to email at weekend it's what am I doing to the person who's receiving the email mm. and it's suggesting that I'm they could be thinking because from a hierarchical approach oh she she expects a reply yes yeah and then you you're into a circle then of you know well actually we are a 24 7 operation mm. and everybody needs downtime mm. you need it reflect you need some reflection space um I, I mean personally I, I choose to work at weekends mm. when when I want to yeah but I don't, it has to be, you have to have that personal choice. And I would say that for the e for evening working as well. Mm. You know, um, I think it's terribly important to have that personal space. And that's a downside to technology because that invades that personal space. You think of the days when we were all receiving memos. Yeah. And the memo would take maybe two or three days to get to people. Well, sometimes you got a, a phone call that would say, oh, ignore that, that memo or something like that. But it, what it did, because of the slower pace, it gave people time to reflect mm. on what they were actually asking. Yeah. And a lot of the time now, people write emails to say, what do you think of this? And they expect an email back by the end of the day. Yeah. Well, it's very difficult to actually plan something, so it's all very, very much quicker, and people feel under a lot more pressure. Mm. Mm. I think email's got a really important part to play in that. It's, mm. uh, you hear um, in, a, in a lot of the press statements now about people's mental health. Yeah. Increasingly. Yeah. I think we need to be very careful about technology and people's mental health. Um, because it is by having clear boundaries, mm. you know, and, and guidelines as to how people manage things because you know, it, it is part work is part of your life. It's mm. not you know well, if you want to be healthy, it has sure. to be part of your yeah. life. Yeah. Yeah. I think technology has a really important part in mm. it. I mean something I find quite useful, um, is that if, if I do need to work out of hours I'll take my inbox offline. Uh, you mm -hmm. know, if, if if you're lucky enough to have a, like a laptop or something which synchronizes to, you can write the emails and queue them up, but don't send them out. And then on the Monday morning at a sensible time, you can then send them out. So you you've done what you needed to do, and it's ready for because no one's going to read them hopefully before Monday anyway, if it's over the weekend. Mm -hmm. But it means you don't have that psychological impact of oh, hang on, this thing's come through at two o'clock on a Sunday afternoon. 
So that can be quite... And I, I think that's that's the key thing. I think we're so easily reachable now, aren't we? Between, you know, for, just from a personal point of view, but between having my, my emails on and my Skype mm. running uh, and a number of other tools that people could easily access and get, get in touch with me within seconds, it's, you know, it is important to kind of distance yourself away from the technology sometimes and allow you to, to work on what you should be spending your time but on. what you're describing is there, we're getting locked into process. Yes. Rather than thinking about, well, actually, what's the impact... Of sending that email, it's not the email; it's actually the the information inside it. And email is just an example of the use of technology, but it's you know it, it's flat. You've lost the bodily contact, mm. you've lost the eyes of the person, you've lost the three dimensional. You know, body language is really really important. It's quite difficult to replace that. Mm. It's quite interesting. We've talked, um, you know, with you about how the technology can affect the people, but we've also we were talking earlier about how the people. Um, are what feed into the technology as well like it, for you you set up these communication tools but it's no good if nobody's using them to communicate and you need the people's input on that side of things and it's like one affects the other and then it goes the other way and the technology starts affecting the people and yeah. affecting life so it's it's yeah. you have to keep it in equilibrium I, yeah. I, you know i always i'm always concerned when i hear people rushing for the technology because you know, it is about keeping it in proportion and thinking about what what are you using it for? Mm. Yeah. And let's enhance what you've got. And then you find people will get creative. Even the most um, cautious people with technology, or if they've got a fixed idea what they want to do, will then feel that they can take that little step. Um, and it might not be, it might be a little one to them. You know, they might not want to go into the big, big wide world of technology, but just a smaller world. And that absolutely suffices for what they need. Mm. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's it's like I've I've said to to people in when we, they come and see our department, it's about digitally enhanced learning. Not we're not here to push the technology. We're here to just help what you're doing. You're the teacher. You're the student. We're just the support. We're mm. not here to force you to use an iPad or force you onto the VLE. Yeah. We do. Um... We again, we, we'll put links to everything we're talking about um, on the blog. But we we do this thing called scenario based design, which is a, a tremendous help, I think, when we're talking to folks because it basically almost takes technology out of the equation and says, right, what do you want to what you know what do you want to achieve? And sometimes people will say, well, I want to achieve something. And we'll go, well, actually, technology isn't the best solution for this. Mm -hmm. You need to do something else. But it's about having the courage to say. Turn the power off and have a conversation. Well, I think that helps. Having somebody who knows about the technology, it's, they think that the technology will solve it, and mm. somebody who knows about the technology will say, no, actually, yeah. you need to go and do this. But I wonder way. sometimes, actually sitting down and planning and designing, that can be just a scary mm. because it's it's it can be perceived as another form of technology because mm. you're talking about planning for technology. Mm. And I sometimes wonder where they're actually looking at what technology people have got themselves and how savvy and competent they are with mm. that. And then, do, you know, using that as the first step to the designing and then the implementation keeps the person actually at the centre of it. Mm. Yes. Yeah. Um, it's just, just, you know, it's just being sensitive to your audience. Yeah. Most of the time. Yeah. I do wonder sometimes if people think that the technology they're already using, they don't think about it as technology. When people come to mm. see us about digitally enhanced learning, they're not thinking about email because they already know it. Yeah. They already use it. And when people come to us thinking about iPads, they're not thinking about their laptops. No. It, they get forgotten. Yeah. And, and they're perfectly usable. It can, it can certainly mm. interrupt take up because they perceive that technology is something, it's a gap. It's, yeah. it's a gap it's away. The new I've got thing. to cross this bridge, and mm. I've got too much work on. I've got too much pressure, so I can't deal mm. with and this. And actually, gap. you can just use what you already know. Absolutely, just different. And if you put it in the context of what people are already using and what they're already happy with, then actually that big step is not a big step anymore. It becomes a tiny mm. step. Yeah. That's really interesting. Mm. Mm. Absolutely. So, I mean, with that all in mind, I mean, uh, are there any particular piece of technology that you use on a, a daily basis that make your life a little bit easier within the context of you know, you know, dealing with people, perhaps, or enabling that communication? Funny, I was asked that same question because I, um, I'm an associate lecturer for the Open University as well. Mm -hmm. I'm passionate about teaching. And as my career has risen into management, I wanted to keep teaching. What, what do you lecture in at the AU then? Mathematics and computing. Excellent. And uh, 
And one of the questions I they asked me that was exactly the same as what you just asked me, and I'll give you the same answer. Mm -hmm. um, my mobile phone. Yep. Because I can do everything on my mobile phone. Mm -hmm. um, I can send emails. I can type documents. Um, I can type out spreadsheets. It's not the most um, brilliant setting for long-term typing in huge documents. Yes. But when I'm traveling, um, it certainly suffices as it gives me immediacy of contact with technology. Mm. I can send text messages. I can uh, Skype. Um, obviously, you've got limitations sometimes with um, storage or the right app that you might need. Yeah. But certainly from an immediacy, as I say, an immediacy and on the move, then that is idea. I think the next thing after that would be an iPad or I've just got a Nexus 7. Mm -hmm. um, for me, the most important thing is, is it portable? I can put it in my handbag mm. and I'm not walking around saying, hello, I've got a great big laptop and I can't carrying <laughs> yeah. it around in my bag. Yes, like a tartan you know? trolley wheelie <laughs> yeah. thing. But, but I yeah. think I'm fairly similar to most people in that respect because if you go up to anybody and say, what technology are you carrying? They'd say, I haven't got any. Mm. And you say, right, got a mobile phone? Yeah. Okay. Um, you got a, an iPad? Some people would say, yeah, mm. you know, they don't necessarily see that. But I think the portability is, is really attractive. You sit on, mm. I'm, I'm, I love traveling and you, you sit on trains, you sit in planes and people are always there sitting with their on buses. Mm. They're playing with their phones. It keeps you connected time. to Absolutely. people and that's mm. why people Absolutely. love it. Mm. Yeah. So I, I think that that's a really enriching opportunity for learning because you can learn on the move. Mm. Fantastic. So, um, if you could wave a magic wand uh, and kind of go or gaze into a crystal ball and look into the future, what would you like teaching and learning to look like, let's say, in five years' time, with respect to technology? Would it be the same as it is now? Would they be doing anything different? Would there be any different kind of pedagogies or uh, any different kind of student experiences? Uh, that's quite a broad question mm. because you've got staff and students yep. involved. Mm. I think if I took it, took it from the staff perspective, first of all, I think I'd like to see an environment where people were happy to be creative. Okay, yeah. Um, more and more driven towards, you know, providing an enriched student experience. But I often um, include staff in that as students. Right, okay. Yep. And increasingly, I think staff and students need to be happy in having a dialogue mm. with their learning. Students, a lot of the time now, are freer and more creative um, and more confident with the use of technology because they've, got, they've all got a, a mobile phone in their pocket. Mm -hmm. A lot of them have got smartphones. Mm -hmm. They've got possibly smart TVs at home. Yep. Um, they, they are quite happy to sit there with a the flicker and, and record things. Mm -hmm. Um, they're on the laptop at home um, and so it can be quite daunting for staff to come in and start feeling as though well I've got this new whiteboard on the screen or I've got I'm mm. supposed to be putting together all this gadgetry yeah but in the middle of all that there's a conversation to be had because actually what students need to see uh, need to be looking to staff as facilitators to guide their learning right okay yeah. and it's a more sort of not a sage on the stage but a guide on the side yeah. i think i actually said those exact <laughs> words earlier yeah. Um, yeah. and i think really that's where the vast experience of staff can really come into play we shouldn't expect staff to have this vast array of skill set mm. of all these technologies and know how to use all of them because mm. they don't need to use all of them it's it's the actual knowledge and facilitation of the of the skills that they need to be guiding yeah. the students. Well, they with. want to be good educators. Yes. In respect yeah. to and whatever we use. That's a challenge because staff perceive as though they've got to know all this stuff. Yeah. But they don't mm. because it's it's more a facilitation role. But it's changing the nature of of teaching, mm. um, and and learning in different ways. It's definitely about that. For me, it's about that dialogue. Mm. Um, and it's difficult to. In certain subjects, because different different subjects have different associations with communication anyway, sure, and interpretation, um, and some subjects will find that dialogue concept more challenging, because some subjects are happier with this sage on the stage approach, mm. and the guide on the side comes more freely with others. Mm. But I'd like to see an environment where people are happy to share and talk, mm. and technology being an enabler rather than 
well, what technology should we use for this lecture? Yes, yeah. Or what technology should we use in this session? Mm. Well, yeah, I think as you alluded to right at the beginning, it's the wrong way around. Mm. Yeah. I guess that uh, certainly people come to a university to get a, an education. Um, if you have the guide on the side, it's actually giving them that experience that they're going to have when they hit the workplace. So it might also spin out to kind of I, uh, for broader. me, if, when you've got the guide on the side, they're getting a far enriched experience because it's not just about subject content, mm. it's about application, it's about life experience as well. And you get that individual perspective as well as the group perspective, so you're getting enhanced learning experience out of it. And hopefully, staff can learn from students as well. I think staff have a really tough time nowadays mm. with increased curriculum development, increased use of, sort of technologies. And it is about the, the, all the communities supporting each other. Yeah. So, um, so we can, you know, deliver a really good student product. Yeah. There seems to be a theme emerging from today, which has been communities. Because Carl was talking about he's been building a community with the security guards, and Elizabeth's been building a community uh, with one of the faculties we've got. So there does seem to be this desire for people to actually work together, and they're just trying to find ways to enable that mm. to take place. I think place. we have to do it, because it's not just here in the university, it's outside as well. People are under a lot of pressure, and it's because all this information is freely available, it's pumped out at you all the time, mm. and it's the filtering process that people need to set up, mm. and we're back to needing people again. Yeah. Yeah. You know, well, we, need, we need human beings to make sense of it all. Yeah. When sort of technology started coming along and everybody separated out and you're in your offices emailing and you never see each other yeah. and now people are using the technology to bring that sense yeah. well, of community you, back in. If you've got the portable device, you can say, come on, let's get out of here, let's go and get a cup mm -hmm. of coffee or whatever it might be or mm -hmm. go for a wander. So, excellent. Please hang up and try again. Okay, well, that's been really, really interesting. So thank you ever so much for coming to talk to us. We are My very, pleasure. very grateful. It's been fantastic. Um, if if people want to learn more about yourself and the work that you do, is there a website they can go to? What's the best way of... Um... Yes, if they look at the university website uh, under Kelt, yep. they'll find us. There's a, a big section there about Kelt people. Brilliant. Because the people as demonstrating the people aspect is really important. <laughs> yeah. So more than welcome. Okay, well, we'll definitely pop a link under there so people can check it out if they want to. That's fantastic. Right, well, in that case then, all that remains for me to do is to say thank you to Carl Sykes. Thank you very much, and hopefully here um, you'll be back next week and catch the next uh, podcast Episode with us. four. Episode yeah. four. Uh, <laughs> Elizabeth Jones. Thank you. You'll notice I'm not saying Mrs. anymore. I got told off of saying Mrs., so there's no more Mrs. anymore. Uh, but Dr. Joe Smedley, thank you ever so much uh, for joining us. It's been a pleasure. And for me, Paul Andrews, it's... Uh, Goodbye and thank you very much indeed. Rock and roll.